Realism focuses on the security dilemma as the driving force in international politics. Uh, and in order to show that the security dilemma is uh, really inexorable, they turn to what we call game theory, which is a branch of mathematics that uses uh, mathematical models of strategic interactions in order to sort of logically demonstrate what kinds of strategies are rational and what ones are not rational. And in particular, we're gonna talk about the prisoner's dilemma, which is the simplest and most widely used game theory model. It's a model that's applied to a wide range of problems, um, not only in international security, but in trade wars, environmental cooperation, and in fact, in all kinds of social problems. A, a simple example is uh, um, contributing to public radio. There is a, there's a simple way to use the, game, the prisoner's dilemma model uh, to uh, understand that problem. Uh, but we're gonna focus not on that today, but on international politics. Broadly, this whole set of problems is known as the collective action problem. And the prisoner's dilemma, uh, what it does is, it's so powerful, is it shows clearly and logically why it is so difficult for states to cooperate uh, to escape the security dilemma. So it's a very stylized model. And it's called the prisoner's dilemma because it follows this, uh, again, this sort of allegory of what we see in police shows on TV when they take two suspects and they separate them and they try to get uh, them to rat each other out. Um, and the question is, are the suspects going to cooperate with each other? And when we say cooperate, we mean cooperate with your fellow suspect, not with the police. Or are they gonna defect, which essentially means you rat out your, uh, your fellow uh, conspirator. Um, and the idea is, and this is what game theory does, is it uh, specifies which payoffs are the best for the different actors. And so here, these are just uh, the order of payoffs from four being the best to one being the worst, right? And, and so essentially, um, what you don't want to have happen is that you uh, cooperate with your partner and keep your mouth shut while your partner throws you under the bus, because that way you're gonna go to jail uh, for a long time. What you'd rather have happen um, is that you both uh, cooperate. Well, the best thing for you, for, for each one is for them to be the one that throws the under, other under the bus. Your partner goes to jail for a long time and you go free. But if you're not gonna do that, uh, the, the second best uh, outcome is that you both keep your mouth shut. Right? And the third best outcome is that you both rat each other out. Now, I'm not sure this is exactly how uh, sentencing and plea bargaining works, uh, but nonetheless, it's an important illustration uh, that gets to the nature of the problem. So let's look at this uh, um, in a little more detail. Um, what should each player do? Well, supposing we're player B, right? We're player B and we wanna know what we should do. Well, if player A cooperates, right? And player B cooperates, we can either get three, which is the second worst outcome, or if we defect, we can get four. So if player A cooperates and we're player B, we want to defect, right? Sorry about that, player A, but we're going to defect. What happens if player A defects? Well, if player A defects now, we can either get the worst outcome, which is one, because they've thrown us under the bus, or we can defect while they defect and we get the second worst outcome. So if they defect, right, we're better off defecting. So the big point here, and it's crucial, is that regardless of what player A does, right, player B is better off defecting. Because the game is symmetrical, uh, regardless of what player B does, player A is better off defecting. So they're both, if they're rational, they are both going to defect. And the result is that you end down in that lower right-hand corner of two and two. What's interesting about that, what's crucial about that, is that there's a place where they could both be better off at the same time. And that's in this upper left-hand corner where they both get their second best outcome, three and three, rather than getting their third best outcome. And so the, the moral of the story, so to speak, or the paradox of the prisoner's dilemma, and it's what it makes such an important model because it shows us something that is counterintuitive, but the logic is really very difficult to refute, that when we each do what's individually rational, the result is something that is collectively irrational. That's the prisoner's dilemma. That's the problem of collective action, that when we each try to protect ourselves, we end up with this suboptimal outcome. 
So now let's just move back from the prisoner's dilemma to the security dilemma. And, and all I've done in this slide is to, is to reframe the, the prisoner's dilemma as a security dilemma, right? We can either uh, refrain from arming, which is what I called cooperate in the previous slide, or we can arm, right? If we both refrain from arming, that's like having an arms control agreement. Um, if we, if, if uh, state A um, are, uh, ref refrains from arming, but state B arms, well then state A is going to be vulnerable to being attacked and, and may cease to exist as a state, right? Same as if it's the other way around. And of course, if both states decide to arm, um, what you get is an arms race or a security competition. And what realism stresses, using the logic of the prisoner's dilemma, um, is that there's really no way to avoid being in this lower right-hand corner. Because if you try to get into that upper left-hand corner, where both uh, states refrain from arming, and the other side uh, cheats on you, you may never get a chance to do anything about it. Because once they've cheated, you're vulnerable, and you could just uh, simply be eliminated as a state. You could be crushed in a war. And so for realists, uh, you always end up here. And there's a famous uh, realist whose book about this whole problem is called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And so it's this tragic notion that, that whether we want to or not, we have to end up in this conflict because the alternative is potential extinction. So obviously the prisoner's dilemma is an abstraction, so it leaves a lot out. Um, and what we want to think about is what are the crucial insights that we gain from this form of abstraction? And of the things that are left out, what do we think are the ones that, uh, that are most consequential that maybe are going to cause us to think that we should question some of these conclusions?